Welcome to the Rajavian Summer Series. Uh, this is the first time in almost 70 years that we've ever done it virtually. Uh, I know you're gonna miss the, uh, the, the food and, and the fellowship, but there are gonna be some advantages to this season. We have seven programs beginning tonight and through August 19th. Uh, the fun part of this is gonna be, you can do this in your pajamas, in your living room, eating a snack and still learning and enjoying things as you always do at Rajavian. Uh, I'm Richard Stanford. I'm the, uh, uh, a member of the Rajavian Committee. Uh, you'll be joined next week by David Rajavian, who wants to welcome you on behalf of the Rajavian Committee and the Rajavian family. Uh, this season, we're going to have uh, two authors, and we're going to have five reviewers, a lot of our favorite reviewers. Uh, the, the, tonight, we're starting with Ali Master and Beyond the Golden Door, Seeing the American Dream Through an Immigrant's Eyes. Uh, we'll talk about Ali in a minute as I introduce him. Uh, we, we have one other author two weeks from now. It's Tracy Warder, uh, and, and she's basically going to be talking about uh, the unexpected spy, her story of life in the, in the uh, FBI and the CIA. And so we have some really wonderful authors who are local authors. Uh, so uh, both of them speak to groups, and you may be interested in contacting both of them. We're also going to have five wonderful reviewers, Nancy Ashley next week with uh, A Kingdom of Their Own, uh, the Palmers of Glen Eyrie. Uh, she's a favorite of ours, and in subsequent weeks, we're going to have uh, Dana Harkey and uh, Mary Robertson. We're going to have Sharon Lucky, and we're going to end the season with our old favorite, Rosemary Rumbly. Uh, who will be giving us the history of the world in six glasses. So from tonight through the night of August 19th, every Wednesday night at 7, uh, you're on this uh, program because you knew how to get on this program from hitting your, your link that we sent by email. If anyone else wants to be part of this, let us know. We will put them on our email list, and they will get the same-day link uh, telling them how to get on this program. So. Uh, welcome to this season of the Rajavian Summer Series. Uh, we're going to have a whole lot of fun. Uh, and now I want to introduce our speaker for tonight, the author, Ali Master, his book, Seeing the American Dream Through an Immigrant's Eye. Ali Master's perspective on the American dream is unique. He has personally experienced the freedoms he touts in this book, Beyond the Golden Door, Seeing the American Dream Through an Immigrant's Eyes. Because he's a former Muslim, Privileges such as freedom of religion came at a great personal risk. Ali is a successful managing partner with the firm of Ernst & Young, EY, and has built and led multiple large businesses. He's a licensed CPA and holds an undergraduate degree in accounting. He's also a graduate of leadership programs from both Kellogg School of Management and Harvard University. Ali has served as a member of EY's Diversity and Inclusiveness Council and is a frequent speaker on a range of topics from business to inclusion to leadership to Islam. His bicultural background uniquely qualifies him to contrast American freedoms and values to those found in Muslim countries. Ali has been featured on and in the Dallas Morning News, Yahoo Finance, The 700 Club, The Eric Metaxas Show. His thought leadership has been published in Salon, CFO Magazine, Bloomberg BNA, Diversity Inc., and Accounting Today. He lives in Rockwall, Texas with his wife and four children and travels frequently across the U.S. and internationally. And now, beyond that, the, the rest of the story, uh, you may have seen Cheryl Hall's article uh, last February in the Dallas Morning News. Full two pages, how an immigrant finds his way to faith and then success. It's Ali and his family and his story. Uh, what I like is... Uh, uh, the ups and downs of it all. It's been very successful, and he has a lot to say about that. But uh, I like I liked the title uh, on, on the Dallas Morning News article, From a Fired McDonald's Burger Flipper to an Ernst & Young Exec, the out-of-the-box life of Ali Master. And so, uh, so you're going you're gonna to get a really fun ride with this. Uh, I do want to read one piece about his book, which is available on Amazon or any other uh, major bookseller. Uh, at Amazon, I noticed the paperback's $10.49, so it's a deal. Uh, this is what Amazon says. Beyond the Golden Door is the compelling, sometimes tense, and often humorous story of how a Pakistani Muslim finds freedom, love, and a new faith while challenging readers to appreciate the liberties found in America. 
So please welcome Ali Master. Well, thanks, Richard, for that introduction. And I'm excited to be the first author to kick off this virtual Rajabian series. That's just uh, a great honor and the great history that the series has. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. This is not what I expected. I expected to actually be um, seeing you live, but this is wonderful because this is too open to the whole community now. Uh, so I'm just going to imagine that I'm making eye contact with you and seeing you laugh at the right times, getting teary-eyed on cue. Um, so let's jump into Beyond the Golden Door. So as Richard said, uh, I'm going to be sharing about my immigrant experience. And there are many immigrants that seek this great land of ours. You know, some come from south of the border trying to look for a life. Some are H-1B visa workers trying to get a job. Um, some are seeking refuge and asylum. My situation was that I was an international student seeking to come to the great University of Texas uh, in Arlington. Uh, to get an education. I had no idea when I wrote this book uh, all the turmoil that would be going on on the topic of immigration uh, as I wrote this book about seeing the American dream through an immigrant's eyes. And um, I am not going to offer some great solutions to this very complex problem that is immigration. Uh, I do feel it should be dealt with with compassion and with some legal solutions. And so, and of course, I had no idea we would be dealing with a pandemic that is going to be testing the resolve uh, of some of our freedoms in this nation and the social injustice that we have seen recently that's bubbled to the surface. So I'll offer my two cents about that as well. But why did I write this book? Uh, ironically, three years ago, uh, I, there was so much divisiveness going on in our country, I just thought that this, uh, this country could benefit from a perspective of an immigrant who has seen uh, the freedoms, experienced them, lived the American dream, and um, maybe a perspective from someone who hasn't grown up here. Because I saw many in second, third, fourth generation uh, perhaps taking some of these values and freedoms for granted. Uh, so that's why I penned this book. So the story is about five distinct and unique American freedoms that I view as precious. And so it's a reminder to those of you who have enjoyed these freedoms and your ancestors have as well. And the second thing you're going to find in Beyond the Golden Door is my faith journey, as Richard alluded. Uh, so the freedom of religion is, is a big part of my story uh, as I look at it through the lens of freedom. So it's about a divine creator and how he uses events and geography and circumstances to bring a person to himself. So it's both a book about freedoms and a book about faith. So with that, let's jump in. And let me tell you a little bit about myself. And Richard's already alluded to it. This picture, my dentist loves this picture. Uh, so what you see is Molly and Isaac on the front. Judy, my wife, um, is there. And then Noah and Emma in the back. Uh, and we live in Rockwall, so right here locally. I pretty much view myself as a Texan at this point with 30 years right here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that I love so much. And I grew up as a young Muslim. And I'll talk a little bit about what does that mean and how do Muslims think about America and about you as an American? Um, I'm an avid Dallas Cowboys fan. This is the year, right? This is the year. So I am passionate about our local team. And yes, I'm a partner at EY. This week, it's 25 years for me at our firm. And I've been a partner for about 18 years. And so I'll share a little bit about my business view and the freedom of entrepreneurship as we discuss. So here's our program today. What we're going to do is I plan to use words, images, and then some readings from the book as well so that you can get a feel for um, how, how I sound in the book. I'm a big believer in images. Uh, a picture is definitely worth a thousand words. So let's get started. Um, and you're going to get a sense of time. Uh, so the story starts... In the 60s, uh, some images you see on your screen. I grew up in Bangladesh, 
Uh, that was East Pakistan at that point. Both India and Pakistan, um, just like United States, were a British colony. And so my parents were pretty affluent, um, and we were living in Dhaka uh, before the war of 1971. And on surface, you see um, a really um, just a fun lifestyle from these pictures. But the book talks about some dark moments also as I grew up. Um, my dad worked for General Electric, uh, an affiliate of GE. So we, we had a chauffeur and a maid and a cook and, and just a gardener and a big home. Uh, and while the outside of the home was secure, the inside was not as secure. And I experienced some sexual abuse in, pretty early in my life. And, and that was a difficult time. And I learned that you had to just deal with such trials alone. Uh, I wasn't able to talk to my parents much about it, and the book gets into the details of that. And, and it just made me feel very insecure, alone, and isolated, and I learned to deal with pain on my own. But it also built a survivor mentality on me, which later, I believe, a creator used for me. So just a little background. The Pakistani society that you see, um, it's very, very different than being in the United States. And those of you that have traveled to any place in the East, uh, especially if it's a Muslim nation, you will, you will see some images like this. So you see a mosque. You cannot really escape knowing that you're living in a Muslim nation when you're around uh, an Islamic nation because you hear calls to prayers from Minaret five times a day. Uh, Islam is in everything that you do, from how you conduct yourself when you interact with the opposite sex, to your adults, to rituals, uh, to how you just uh, follow the rules. It, it's everywhere. You see uh, the scene of the bus, and it, it, Pakistan is a land of the haves and the have-nots. I grew up on the have side, but this scene of people riding hours to their jobs is Riding on top of the bus is not that unusual. People take great risks uh, to survive in my homeland. And then you see this fortress. Uh, that just represents the Fort of Lahore and the Mughal dynasty. Uh, Lahore is a beautiful place where I grew up. And then I moved to Karachi, which is like the New York City of Pakistan. So what was the world view of my parents. You can see it's a pretty debonair, debonair couple my parents are. Uh, my dad used to love these beautiful bow ties and, and there would be parties thrown and, and, uh, in our home. And I called my dad Abu uh, and I call my mom Ami. Those are terms of endearment for parents. Uh, what was their worldview? Well, my dad uh, being associated with GE and, and, and he was a, a moderate Muslim, I would I would say, in fact, I remember this little bottle of Johnny Walker that would just sit in his cupboard. And every time the GE people from America would come in, uh, a little bit of the volume would be consumed. But he was a very moderate man, very careful and cautious, a good businessman, very honest. My mom was a trailblazer, and she uh, was one of the first women to go to university. She went to London and st stayed there on her own. She taught in the college. But as time progressed, my mother became more and more stronger in her faith. And so she was the one that raised me to believe in Islam. And here are some of the things that I was taught as a Muslim. And it's something that just about every young Muslim boy or girl is taught and and what you see here is just young boys like me reading the Quran the the language of Pakistan is Urdu that's the national language in fact it might surprise you most of my fellow Muslims don't speak Arabic but the book that they read is written in Arabic and we were memorizing the Quran even though we didn't understand Arabic but here are some key tenets that I was uh, just grown and it was ingrained in me that Muhammad was the last and final and greatest prophet. Uh, he was a prophet of Allah and Allah was a God of Abraham and Jesus was a respected prophet, but he never died for anyone. Uh, he was an important figure 
uh, but he was a prophet. And I had respect for him, but, um, but Muhammad was, of course, the greatest prophet. And, of course, why the discrepancy? Well, Bible was corrupted. A very simple, straightforward answer that was taught for all of us. That there is no need to challenge what you believe because, in the end, it's all going to be reconciled, but the Bible has all been changed. We, we don't have any need to question why change, change by whom, when change, all those questions will be answered. Um, but simply put, it's been changed. And of course, all Americans are Christians. That is how we were raised, um, that if your name is uh, David or Luke or Mark, straight out of the Bible, why wouldn't you be a Christian, right? So this whole idea of believing in something later in life and choosing it is novel to a Muslim. You are born a Muslim and if you're born in a Muslim household. And those were, my, those were my views. And what did I think about Americans? Well, most of the views formed in the 80s uh, are from syndicated TV shows. So I watched Green Acres or Chips or Six Million Dollar Man or just um, many other shows that are just transported that show you a view of America. Shows like Dallas, for example, that was my exposure. So I thought everybody in, in Texas was like JR. Uh, sounds naive, you may laugh, but that's how we thought. Okay, so then what happens? Something very important before we come to my journey that starts in the US. Uh, about the age of 16, I learned a really important fact. Um, I learned through sheer coincidence that I was actually not the child of the two parents that I was talking about. In fact, I discovered that I had been adopted and by my aunt and uncle and my parents had actually tragically passed away. And so I was orphaned at a young age, adopted from the time I was a child, and this dark secret just remained and my parents chose never to tell me. I just happened to learn about it on the streets from a friend. Uh, but it, it was a difficult time to sort of realize that. But again, as we get into my story, you will see how our divine creator used even my discovery of my birth identity being hidden from me as someday I'm going to learn about my spiritual identity that perhaps had also been hidden from me. So just a little tidbit, we don't have time to cover all of the emotions that I went through, but if you read the book, you will experience that as to how I discovered it and what it meant. So here I am in the 80s, 1986, at a young age of almost 19, after finishing high school, coming to America. Very few from my generation get this amazing luxury. You have to go through a grueling process. You know, take the SAT, take the test of English as a foreign language. Of course, you have to have money to be able to afford an expensive education in America. And this is where I learned that my dad, um, my adoptive father, basically turned in his pension, his whole life's pension for one year's worth of education at the University of Texas at Arlington. And so why Arlington? Well, I had a dear cousin that was attending the University of Texas. And of course, just like every parent, parents want to send you somewhere where someone can watch over you. And at least that was the illusion <laughs> that my parents had, that my cousin will be able to do that. Her name in the book is Nazneen. Of course, I had to change all the names and identities in the book. Um, and so here I come in the 80s, an amazing time. Ronald Reagan's in the office. Um, all is well. Um, and I get on a plane and I come to America. And this is where life changes radically in a matter of a plane flight. Because before that, I'd only traveled to India. And the Indian culture, while different, there are some similar roots between the two, and half my family was in India. So two hours away is about as far as I had traveled at that point. So here I come, and I thought I would do my first reading here to give you, the audience, a, a feel for what does an immigrant, what does a foreigner feel like, especially a young foreigner who is a student. 
So let me just read from you for you a little bit of what I went through as a young kid here in Texas. So here we go. My first few days at Nazneen's apartment were novel. I loved her apartment complex, Brookhaven Apartments, such a pleasant Western name. It had its own pool. The summer heat in Texas certainly did not make me homesick. The auto dealership right across from the apartment complex sold Camaros, and I was awed by those gorgeous cars and the bright colors. Everything seemed amazing. And then it hit me. Unstoppable bouts of deep anxiety, homesickness, and sheer panic about the unknowns that lay before me. I don't know if it was the news Nazneen gave me earlier about the tripling of the international student rates per credit hour or if, or if it was being alone in the apartment all day long waiting for her to return. This is before the semester had started. Maybe in a strange way, watching General Hospital and Days of Our Lives, the two leading, uh, two leading daytime soap operas, took its toll. Everyone I saw in those two shows was rich, beautiful, and had relationships. Everyone I saw, yeah, had relationships. Frisco and Felicia, Robert and Anna, Luke and Laura. I was nothing like them. And sitting here 8,000 miles away from home, alone all day with barely enough money to pay for one semester's worth of tuition, no job, no cool clothes, no car, and no girl. It seemed a forlorn existence. Time was crawling. Later that afternoon, I walked outside and saw cars whooshing by. Everyone seemed to have a purpose but me. No amount of Archie comics could prepare me for what I was experiencing. Full-blown culture shock. Let me tell you a little bit more. Hopefully, that starts to give you an idea of the isolation one feels when you enter this nation. So a little more. It had taken me over 30 hours to arrive in Texas, and it had changed my world completely. One moment I was rich, now I was poor. One moment I knew the language, now I was advising other foreign students to watch out when the state trooper praises you. A little bit of context for you. Everybody needs. ID when you come to Texas or anywhere in the States. You got ID? No, I got to go get a license. No problem. If you've driven in Karachi, you can drive anywhere except for the wrong side of the road business. So I take my license with this big old Texas Ranger who literally had the hat on. Everything is going well. And then we're backing into reverse, backing onto Cooper Street, a really busy street in Arlington and everything is going well and I'm going zooming towards the street and I'm like when is he going to tell me to stop and he goes that's good son and I'm like he likes my reverse and I keep going he looks at me kind of funny and I'm like what's the problem he goes that's good son and I'm like okay is he going to tell me to stop and then he goes that's good and he pulls the handbrake so not knowing the language can be literally life-threatening let me continue one moment <laughs> Uh, I could scan the scoreboard on any TV screen and know instantly whether my team was winning or losing the cricket, squash, or field hockey match. Now, American-style football was the only game in town. One moment I was tall, dark, and handsome, or so I believed. Now, I was only dark. I had gone from being normal to being diverse. I could go on, but you should read more of the book to get that experience. But there was some funny moments and there was some tragedy. Um, so that brings me to my first freedom, uh, a very unique freedom that perhaps the average American doesn't even think about, and that is the freedom to fail. So having been raised with a silver spoon in my mouth, I had no idea how to deal with life in America. Everything seemed to have a deadline. Everything had structure, uh, and I had not been raised with any of that, and I, I had a real hard time. I even thought I'm going to follow Islam and be a good Muslim, but all the decadence attractions were causing failure even in that end. I got my first job, but I never, ever worked. I never swept a bathroom floor. I remember two girls from my political science class coming in and just hiding in that bathroom. 
Um, I had my first girlfriend experience. Uh, I name her Lindsay in the book. Uh, and she um, had a codependent experience. Uh, her, her family was very, very dysfunctional. Her dad was an alcoholic. And, and she had no interest in going to college. And she didn't want me to have any interest in going to college. And I started flunking out in school. Everything was falling apart. My first exposure to alcohol, which you're not supposed to drink as a Muslim, by the way, my first expo expo exposure to drugs, all of that was just piling on. And the pressure being the only child, an adopted son who's supposed to honor his family, was going down the drain. And I call this chapter Crash and Burn. And let me read to you just a little chapter of what that felt like as I very quickly, just a couple of years in the States, and I am already falling apart. Here's what this sounds like. I felt like I was watching my entire life circling the drain. It had barely been a year since I landed on American soil, yet in so many ways I felt I had aged a decade. The land of opportunity had quickly become the land of consequence. Every action or inaction had a consequence in this country. If you don't pay your bill, your phone line is disconnected. If you don't drop a course in time, you receive an F. If you don't call into work, you're fired. If you don't get, if you don't set physical boundaries with your girlfriend, you become a father. I could barely raise myself, let alone someone else. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. This was not the life I dreamed of, nor was this the American college experience I expected. At some point during our fourth or fifth argument that night, I snapped talking about my girlfriend, and we would argue almost every night. I wanted the pain and conflict to end, and I most definitely wanted Lindsay, um, I definitely wanted Lindsay to pay for it and feel guilty for wrecking my life. I had seen a set of knives in the kitchen. I pushed Lindsay aside with my right hand and opened the knife drawer as Lindsay screamed, begging me to stop. Seconds later, I was bleeding profusely from my left wrist. Dizziness overcame me, and I fell. That, very quickly, was a low point in my life. Not every foreign student goes through that low point, but many struggle with what I've described. So what happens next? Just like any good story, there is a girl. And God had a plan. And I start to realize this freedom to fail and how many take advantage of freedom. And you pick yourself up from the bootstraps. And the entire American system actually has an ability to fail and start over, whether it's bankruptcy, whether it's starting in a different school with a clean slate, whether it's a red shirt freshman that tries to make it even though he or she didn't get drafted. There are many ways to fail and succeed. So I found another job at another McDonald's in Arlington, and there is this girl, Judy. Um, and at this point, Lindsay, my girlfriend, I thought was a Christian, and my roommate, who used to go to church on Sundays and do, do drugs Mondays through Saturday, was a Christian. So I just thought mom was right. and. Uh, I just needed to get my degree and try to make it back home to Pakistan. But Judy was the first person that I met who was different. And how was she different? Well, first of all, there was this character and integrity about her at a young age uh, of 19 that I had never seen in anyone else. Even after the shift was over, she'd be cleaning tables waiting for her ride. Um, I had not met someone like that, so I got to know her better. I was like, well, why are you like that? And she would credit that to her faith, to Christ. And I was like, well, that's interesting. She's just one of those happy people. But I really liked her. Now, she wanted to get rid of me while I wanted to get, go out on a date with her. So, of course, 
She said, how about you come to church with me on Sunday, thinking I'm going to go, of course not. I'm a Muslim. I don't go to church. But I really wanted to get to know her better, so I said yes. And sure enough, not only did she have this issue of being integrous in character, but her parents were like that too, and her friends were like that too. This was starting to get disturbing, and this brings us to the second freedom, which actually I break in two parts. And I, this is really the freedom of religion. Of all the freedoms that I've experienced in this great nation, the freedom of religion I would put up top. And I break it into first the freedom to seek the truth. What do I mean by that? Well, on my birthday, uh, remember, I didn't speak Arabic, but everything I had read about the Quran, the book that I was raised with, was in Arabic. On my birthday that year, I got my first English Bible. And, and I was like, well, this is interesting. And I started to read it. And I started to hear about who this Christ is. And he is not at all who I had been raised to believe. And despite my efforts, I was still drawn to him, and I was seeing this character lived out in Judy and her family. So what do I do? I go to the library. I have to, of course, disprove all this, because surely this can't be all right, um, the things that I'm learning in the Bible. And what's amazing about America is you can just go to a library and just seek. You can find a book on everything. My problem was for every one book that I was finding about Quran being the right book and how Bible has been changed. I found six books. They were saying that the Bible we have today is a pretty inerrant word of God. And, and, and I was just drawn to Christ. Um, and, and six months had now gone by. And in my head, I had become convinced that what I was learning and seeing was the truth. But in my heart, I knew there was no way. This, there was too big of a chasm ever ever accept. Meanwhile, Judy and I had become very close. And one day, she gets a phone call from a friend who calls her on the carpet and says, hey, what are you doing? You're actually dating someone who totally is a Muslim, and that's really not a good idea. And at this point, our young damsel makes a very wise decision. And I still remember, it's the fall, we're at an Amy Grant concert, and we break up. And she calls our relationship off. Probably one of the best things that has happened to me. Uh, so at this point, I blurt out, okay, 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 well, I have been studying about Christ now for six months, and I'm going to go ahead and become a Christian. She's like, well, that's, that's great, but you and God need to spend some time together. So I was just, I didn't know what I was talking about at that point. I was just blurting it out. I just did not want to end that relationship. So we cry I drop her all the way to North Texas, where she was going to Denton, and I go back to Arlington, and I'm left alone with my decision. But I had learned too much from the Bible. I had learned and tasted this freedom to seek without persecution. So you could never do this in Pakistan, because there are laws about going out and studying anything but what you have been raised with. And that brings us to the second freedom, which I think is even more important. You see, you can read and search and explore things, philosophies and faiths. It's one thing to study them. It's another to be allowed to actually believe them. At some point, I take two weeks off from McDonald's, which is a big deal for me as a college student. But I just had to get deeper. And I read the Book of Romans cover to cover. And at some point during those two weeks, is when the information goes from the head to my heart and I decide I'm going to follow Christ. Um, but it's really still, I'm in the West, things are comfortable, I'm going to churches, I'm getting pats on the back, great job, and I'm sharing my story. It's one thing to accept all of that in the West. It's quite another to have your faith tested in going back home Several years go by, and I just learn more, and I grow more in the faith. Judy and I write back to each other, and I feel that when you've discovered this amazing treasure that lies around in America everywhere, I think many homes have like dozens of Bibles, and they're never even read sometimes. And here I was discovering this amazing 
freedom and faith. And I need to go tell my parents. As you can see, my parents have now gotten older. I go back home uh, to tell them about what I, what I had discovered. And this picture you're seeing is a scene, not just of my parents, but then on the bottom, you'll see people just drop everything to pray. Shops close down in the middle of the day and people stop to pray five times a day. And I just thought that was fascinating. Um, so what happens? Again, we don't have time to unpack all the pain and the experience of going back home alone to share what you had discovered about Christ. But I did. <clears throat> and my dad had lost like 50 pounds worrying about me. You see, Islamic culture and the way it defines love is that if you must believe what I believe, if you don't believe what I believe, then you don't love me. You must share that same philosophy. So I had brought shame and dishonor to my parents and to my family, and they were being persecuted. <clears throat> so off I went to a psychiatric ward. Yes, a psychiatric ward, because my parents felt like rich Americans in Texas had influenced me, or this beautiful girl, Judy, had voodooed me, and I needed to be brainwashed. So I spent days listening to tapes and having an analysis done on whether what I believed was truly what I had made as a choice or was it just influence. Thankfully, that didn't work because the more persecution came, the more this Jesus that I learned about in America became real. After several months of living with my family and sharing, I was able to make it back to the States. During that time, Judy and I would write to each other. And I think she finally noticed that I had truly changed. And so when I come back, I felt like God was saying, it's time to pop the question. We get back together. And I talk in my book about the freedom to love. And we do get married. We had two weddings, a Western wedding in a church, of course, and an Eastern wedding um, because getting married in Islam, is, it's a form over substance situation. You just say your vows in Arabic, and I didn't think there was anything wrong in saying your vows in your Arabic. So we honored my parents with that second wedding. I talk about freedom to love. It's a freedom that perhaps many Westerners don't take very seriously and they take it for granted. But do you know, it's just been not that long where people in my country, in Pakistan, just can marry who they want. Free will marriages were had to be approved by the Supreme Court. Before that, a girl couldn't marry someone without an adult, a dad or an older brother even allowing for that. Love is expensive in the Muslim world. Here, you can choose to meet to marry or not. Uh, so the freedom to love is amazing. And I talk a lot about how relationships work in the East versus how they work in the West. Uh, but let me progress. So we get married. And when you get married, working at McDonald's, you don't really have enough income, as great as I love that company. Uh, it's not enough money to be able to provide for a family. So. I take my customer service skills and I observe that even a place like McDonald's, you can start at the ground level, you can be a hamburger flipper, but you can go far beyond either at McDonald's or outside. These experiences are transportable. And I want all that are listening to understand how precious this freedom is. You can make a living in America doing so many things. Not so in many parts of the world. I was told I could only be an engineer or a doctor. Those were my two options. Never mind the business people were going to be hiring these engineers and doctors down the road. Uh, but you can't really survive that easily in other parts of the world. And here, you could start a restaurant. You can own 10 restaurants. Or you can take those skills and go somewhere else. And that's what I chose to do. So my customer service experience led me uh, to finish an accounting degree. I just thought I needed to go deeper into business. So I went and studied business and accounting. Meanwhile, I got a job learning about some very niche tax issues that I'm not going to bore you with, thankfully. But here was this business that I was doing customer service for that took technology 
and tax and brought it together and was offering an amazing product and doing quite well. And I fell in love with this business. Sounds nerdy, I know, but I fell in love with this very niche tax business. And I started my first company at the age of 23. And here I am, newly married, knocking on doors and miserable failure again. It's very difficult to start a business. It's easy to start it, uh, I should say, very difficult to retain it and make it prosperous. Easy to start it in America. Um, and so my dream for being an entrepreneur at that point died, but another window opened and I got hired by a local CPA here in Dallas. Uh, his name was Ron. And he's like, why don't you do this for me? So I started to learn about intrapreneurship, where you're starting a business inside another business. And lo and behold, uh, through his mentorship and sponsorship, that business started to do well. And you know, many of you listening have a lot of privilege and power in your own businesses. And I would encourage you to find someone to not just mentor, but sponsor which is different. A sponsor takes risks and open doors for others, and that's what Ron did. So my failure turned into a small success, and then that built on another success, and eventually uh, he coached me to go, maybe you ought to go to a big six firm because you have an accounting degree. At that point, it was big six. Today, it's big four, as many of you would know, and Ernst and Young was one of them. And once again, um, Another door opened and I knocked on that door, got hired, and the world will try to always conform you. Uh, culture does that, universities do that, accounting firms do that, uh, but, but I guess I was just not born to be conformed. So from the very early stage, I started to build businesses even at EY. And, and the, the culture of my firm is very entrepreneurial. And thankfully, here again, another sponsored uh, opportunity by another partner. I build a business. It grows. Uh, so I view my firm similar to America. It's an opportunity to glow and grow. Uh, but belonging is a two-way street. So I found belonging at my firm, but I had to do my part. What an amazing nation we have where we can build a business and work hard at it, and if it fails, you start over. So eight years later, I made partner, which was a pretty fast climb, and um, my dad and mom were finally starting to take notice and starting to say, hmm, maybe Allah is blessing you. You see, the Muslim culture really views those things as important, uh, education, business success. So after building this business, life continued and a dark time came right about the time when I made partner. I made partner in 2002, but right before that, a terrible time was faced by this nation in 9-11, obviously. And this was a time that I know hurt many of you that are listening it was a difficult time for me as well. You see, being a brown person, uh, my allegiance at this point was to America, but many Westerners were seeing me like those that hurt you. And so it was a very difficult time. Uh, and I remember just driving around, not wanting to go to an airport, afraid of persecution. And I'm very proud, though, of how the American community handle themselves. And I think President Bush did the right thing in challenging us to not take out our anger on the masses. And I write in this book that the fundamental principle of judging people based on their individual actions and not as a collective group was tested and in this author's view prevailed. And that's what's going on even today. Uh, we are, you know, some are judging police. They're judging the police and if they're all bad, of course they're not all bad. We should not judge a large collective group by the actions of the few. And, and this was a very difficult time. And I remember going back to Pakistan right after 9-11, and I was shocked by my parents' reactions. They wouldn't even acknowledge the reality that this was a terrorist event. When I came back, this just created so much patriotism in me at that point, I was a permanent resident, resident, 
and I just needed to make a choice and I took the oath of being an American citizen in 2002 one of the proudest moments of my life um, you know these documents that you read uh, like the Declaration, Declaration of Independence they're sacred words to me um, that that I've experienced when when it says that all men are created equal that they're endowed by their creator those are big words that I've experienced of course we are experiencing social injustice right now and many have said Ali are you still sure that America is a great nation do you still agree with that yes I agree with that we're on a journey and we have a long ways to go of course Christ is the only answer that I can think of he is the one that bridged many of these divides in his own time when he's engaging with a Samaritan woman across race and gender or whether he is calling out the hypocrisy when a woman caught in adultery is brought to him whether he's touching a leper that has been ostracized that is all we can do is follow him um, as we do this there's more that we can do for the social injustice and I was going to share another interesting event and I have to say I am not a black person I am brown and I'm learning that some of the injustices that I experience don't even compare so please don't um, see this as me trying to equate whatever prejudice I experience to what some others in the community go through we are on a journey there's more we can do there is talk these days about being anti-racist and I agree with that and let me read to you this interesting story that happened to me what does it look like what more can we all do here's a story as we start to head towards the close and I call this don't touch my food this is what happened to me one day at McDonald's as I was working there you don't touch my food with your hands he yelled <clears throat> the young man's angry words echoed throughout the lobby of McDonald's the entire store packed with crew people lunch rush customers mothers with children and more than a dozen Martin High School students all came to a stunned silence shocked at his rudeness it was Monday around noon and I was running the shift in my first week as a manager I had been so excited about my new role I was calling the bin which meant that my back was to the customers as I communicated with the cooks cooking the burgers and sending them my way to be wrapped in the restaurant business you meet <coughs> serve manage and report to all kinds of characters but this was a first for me I, w I slowly turned around to make eye contact with my accuser he was a fair-skinned young man sporting tattoos and long blonde hair his bloodshot eyes glared straight back at me I decided to stay calm my hands were clean it was company policy to wash hands with hand sanitizer before wrapping food but as they had taught me in training the customer is always right yes sir was all I could muster as I carefully pulled out two wrapping gloves and continued to wrap the food you got a problem with that he snapped is this really happening I thought I was merely 24 months removed from living in a bungalow in Pakistan with a chef two maids a gardener and a chauffeur and now this punk was treating me like a leper I continued to calmly wrap the food and said no sir I don't at this point I noticed two other customers also white one big burly man in a tank top with some significant tattoos of his own and the other a gentleman in a, in a suit both started cussing the young man out get your butt out of this store before I break your face screamed the larger man several customers including the suited gentleman were trying to restrain him from laying hands on my offender he continued he's trying to be courteous to you you moron you are a disgrace to us all several moms piped in their agreement as well pulling in their kids close the young man didn't even wait for his Big Mac he was gone all I could muster was a smile and a thank you I kept working the bin and we all resumed to the organized chaos 
of the lunch hour. That moment has stayed with me. It was an American moment where strangers saw injustice and felt compelled to act, to stand up to evil. The core American values of fair play, equality, and doing the right thing, even at some personal risk, bubbled to the surface. I was so proud of my defenders. They reaffirmed my faith in common American decency, something that is rarely mentioned in Eastern newspapers. So that's what we can do. We can call out injustice where we see it. We can keep working towards that ambition that all men are created equal. There's more to do. Life continued. Kids happen. Grandkids have a lot of power. Those of you who have them know what I'm talking about. Um, and this is probably the completion of me being a Texan over here at a ranch um, just 18 years after s just setting foot on American soil. And the rebuilding of bridges continued with my parents. You know, as I said, Pakistani culture and Muslim culture is an honor shame culture and I had brought some dishonor to them with my decisions but my career success my family my continued to go back home and take care of my parents was like drip 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 of love 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 and over time those bridges were rebuilt with both my parents and with my family and I actually have a lot of hope that someday I'm going to see them both again. Uh, both of them um, have opened their eyes to the same Jesus that I got to know. So again, <laughs> we don't have time to get into how all those miracles happen, but if you read the book, you will, you will see that journey uh, and the transformation that I went through occur. Um, so as we come to a close, few things in the book that after those freedoms are discussed I unpack. I unpack the question in a non-academic way. Where does freedom come from? These five freedoms that I described to you, and there are many more, the freedom to seek the truth, to fail, to build a business, to self-govern ourselves. Where do they come from? And I lay out a, a case that our values, they come from those values that are inextricably linked to Judeo-Christian values. You see, that's why it's so difficult to transport democracy because not everybody sees those Judeo-Christian values. Not every nation believes that all men are created equal. Some believe that you know, there are freedom and liberty and justice for the few, for the rich for the man, but not for all. And again, my book acknowledges that we are not a perfect nation. We have work to do. But these freedoms come from those Judeo-Christian values. Absent those, we won't have those freedoms. So let me just end with this one final story as we come to our time. I call this one Grace Beyond Measure. Um, and this one's a little long, so listen in and enjoy, and then we will end. This is what happened to me uh, one day at an airport. I could really reword my book and call it The Adventures of Ali Master at Airports. There are many stories. So I'll leave you with this one. It was the summer of 2000, and I was rushing to the Long Beach Airport to catch a flight to Dallas for my daughter's ballet recital. My client meeting had run late, and I would be cutting it excruciatingly close, but there weren't many flight options available. Compared to LAX, the Long Beach Airport was diminutive, but also easy to get in and out of. That's what I was counting on. I checked in my, checked in my rental car and was running full bore to get through security into my departure gate. I approached just as the gate agent was shutting the exit door that led to the tarmac. I was a full five minutes past my departure time. I made a feeble attempt to, at begging to board the plane, but she shook her head and gave me a you know better than that look. I was an elite frequent flyer, but nobody gets on a plane five minutes after departure time once the gate is closed. Shoulders slumped, I made my way to the little restaurant upstairs to wait 
for another five hours for the next flight to Dallas. I was going to miss the recital. I sat down at a table by the window and noticed that a Super 80 jet was still standing on the tarmac. It looked to be this, at the same spot where I thought my missed Dallas plane was. Why is the plane still there? Five minutes passed and the plane hadn't budged. Hmm, is there a mechanical delay? Hallelujah, maybe I still have a chance. I was an optimist at heart, so I ran back down with my bags in tow to the same gate agent. Is my plane still out there? I asked her, earnestly trying to give her my sweetest I fly a ton and I'm an important business executive smile. No, that is not your plane, she responded in a matter-of-fact tone. That's a plane headed to Tampa. The gate area was virtually empty. Suddenly, she seemed to have a change of heart and said, let me see your boarding pass, with a sense of urgency that confused me a bit. Why does she care? I'm here for five hours. The next thing I knew, she was on a walkie-talkie to someone. Then she looked at me and inquired with a stern voice, you got your bags with you? I nodded. Come on, then follow me quickly, please. I obeyed. The plane was less than a hundred yards away on the tarmac with one of those moving staircases contraptions being driven to it. Nah! The gate agent looked straight at me trying to suppress a smile. This will never happen again. Here you go. She held out a new boarding pass with a smile. I couldn't believe it. I was utterly confused. As if reading my mind, she added, they will explain it to you when you get on board. Then she turned and headed back to the gate. I climbed the staircase, bracing myself for the angry glares of all passengers, glares reserved for late arriving frequent flyers who pull their weight to get on a plane at the last second. As the door opened to the Super 80, I flipped over my green boarding pass, expecting to be in the middle seat at the very back of the plane. To my ast astonishment, the pass read 6A, first class. What in the world? I'm upgraded. Cool. As I entered the plane, I noticed there were no other passengers in first class. Three flight attendants stood there greeting me. Welcome, Mr. Master. How are you? A blonde-haired 30-something flight attendant asked. Now I noticed that not only was the first class cabin empty, but so was the entire coach cabin. I had never seen an outbound jet completely absent of passengers. It was surreal. Where? Where's everyone else? I asked. A male flight attendant responded, grinning ear to ear. You're it, Mr. Master. This is actually a deadhead flight to Tampa via Dallas. Now buckle up, please. As I followed instructions, I couldn't help smiling. This is going to make for a fun story. After a smooth takeoff, all three flight attendants were fawning all over me. Would you care for another meal, Mr. Master? Yes, please. More Chardonnay, Mr. Master? Absolutely. Craig, the male flight attendant, had a frisbee on the plane and wanted, it, want, wanted to see if, if he could throw it to me in coach. You'd be amazed how large an empty Super 80 jet feels empty. Mid-flight, the pilot decided to get in on the fun. He's, his voice resounded over the PA. Ali, this is Captain Shelton speaking. I hope you're enjoying your journey with us. We're flying over Albuquerque right now, heading towards Texas. It is hard to match the experience of hearing a voice over a PA calling you by name at 35,000 feet as you gaze into the cloud. When we landed in Dallas, I thanked Captain Shelton and his crew profusely and then strutted down the jet bridge and out the other side. I got a few strange looks from the waiting passengers at DFW when no one else emerged from the plane. I smiled and headed home for my daughter's ballet performance. I was going to be on time after all. In so many ways, what was gifted to me that day in Long Beach, California is exactly what has been given to me by America and by God. In this country, I've experienced undeserved opportunity and grace beyond measure. That's really the only solution I have to the challenges that we face today. I hope every immigrant can experience this kind of ex example.
this kind of grace. So go, be at peace, um, give grace beyond measure, enjoy this session, the other sessions that follow, get the book. Uh, you, we, I would love it if you can connect with me. Pretty easy to find. And God bless you and have a great day. Um, well, if that does not inspire you, then you are incapable of being inspired. Uh, uh, as an American who was born here, a native, uh, it is so enlightening for me to see the American dream through an immigrant's eyes. I can't do that. I do not realize the gifts that we have. And so the inspiring story of the life of Ali Master, his ups and his downs and his ultimate success, uh, helps inspire us as Americans at a, at a very contentious time. Uh, remember our gifts and, and get yourself a copy of Beyond the Golden Door, Seeing the American Dream Through an Immigrant's Eyes. Next week will be Nancy Ashley reviewing uh, a, a Kingdom of Their Own, The Palmers of Glen Eyrie. She's one of our favorite reviewers. Your hosts will be David Rajavian and Amy Berry. So see you next week.